Well, welcome everyone to another of uh, these very short little devotionals, the Messiah devotionals. I'm just uh, thought I'd do something uh, most mornings, just a little uh, thing, just to start the day together. I've been working through um, reading John Newton's um, sermons on Handel's Messiah, and what he does is just pick up um, a number of scriptures that just give a broad sweep of the gospel, and there's the, those of you who with the, uh, the Messiah, uh, the the choral piece, we'll know that um, it's all scripture is set to music and then the story, of the gospel story is sung through. So what you might like to do, I'm just going to go through each part, um, each time I do one of these devotionals and then if you can get hold of the Messiah online or CD or something, just listen to each part because um, it just gives you a chance to, to then meditate on the scripture, think about the scripture um, that we go through. So we're up to part three today and uh, that is found in Haggai 2, 6-7. You have to excuse this very blowy wind out there so it sounds, um, and it's a very strong wind, very sunny so everything's a little <laughs> noisy and bright but it's a nice morning. Anyway, uh, Haggai um, chapter 2 verses 6-7. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the, treasure, the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And that's uh, an interesting couple of verses in light of what we're, <laughs> of what we're going through at the moment. Uh, and I guess the first thing to say is um, it talks about shaking, shaking the heavens and the earth. And uh, I guess for most people, um, well, probably all of us, to be honest, we all we all tend to feel um, we like being in control. We like feeling that we're in control of life, that we've got it managed. We know what's going to happen. We like to know our health is good, our money situation is good, our relationships are good. Um, we like to know that we're able to fix things that go wrong. And most people go through life feeling that they are in control, feeling that they're able to manage everything in life. And then what happens for every single person who's ever lived is shakings come into life where suddenly we find our health is under threat or our financial situation gets challenged or relationship strains or difficulties come into play and suddenly we feel that something has been imposed on us that we, we didn't choose. We're not, we're not, we don't want it, we don't like it and it shakes everything. Foundations, what we've built, everything in life just feels to be uh, shaken and uh, I, I don't think there's probably a person on the planet at the moment that wouldn't say at the moment they don't feel shaken by what's going on with the coronavirus. It has shaken not just parts of the world, it's shaken the world. And here in these verses it says, once more I will shake the heavens and, and the earth. And um, we can read something like that and think, well how on earth can God shake the heavens and the earth? Well, when we're just looking naturally at the pandemic we're facing, the, the, the shaking that's taken place um, just in the affairs of men uh, and yet God says he's also able to shake things up so that um, the way we viewed things or the way we've lived before is affected and we can feel um, we, we mostly feel sh sad when shaking in life takes place often when we've been through something we can look back on it and say well I've learnt something from that or God brought good out of it and Certainly we know in the Bible it says, you know, all things work together for the good of those that love God. So for those of us who are Christians, um, there is a great hope we have that actually whatever shakings we go through, God God is, doesn't abandon us in those things. He, he will navigate us safely through. We get closer to him, we grow in him. He does things in us, brings out treasure in us and also enriches us. The Bible says he transforms us from one degree of glory to another. So... So you know, we, we, we should as Christians know that even through pain and loss, that's not our choice, um, God will work things out for good. And it's important that this time we remember 
you know, weeping may remain a night, but joy comes in the morning. If the enemy comes in one way, he'll flee from you by seven. Um, Joseph reflecting on his life. You meant this for harm, but God meant it for good. That God will always bring a redemptive element out of even the most difficult trying situations. And some of you watching online may be going through, you know, real sense of shaking and feeling really quite overwhelmed with it all. And what happens is we can we can feel disorientated. We can feel grief, mourning, loss. Um, uh, we can feel even panic. I mean, I think mental health gets really challenged at such times when we're not really um, feeling in control of things. So, um, you know, these these are all things that we we are vulnerable to. Um, but anyway, what, what what is it that God is talking about shaking? Well, He was talking about shaking actually the whole way that humankind relates to Him. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, Haggai was, was prophesying into an Old Testament system, a priestly system where animal sacrifices were brought to the temple. The temple was where God's presence was. He wasn't with individual people. His presence was in one location in Jerusalem. The priests would go in, offer sacrifices. Blood would be shed so that sin could be atoned for, looking by, by, by faith that God would accept these sacrifices on our behalf. There was a, a longing, a looking for something, but no one ever really felt that was a completely satisfactory answer. It was, we, we, we're shedding blood that sin might be forgiven. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there, there is no forgiveness for sin. Sin has to be atoned for. So the Old Testament system was running like this. And uh, Haggai prophesies into this and says, once more, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I'll fill this house with glory. So he's saying there's something about his house, his temple, where he was going to fill it with glory. He was going to do something so revolutionary, so incredible, that what those who were just bringing the Levitical system of priestly activity, they, they would, instead of doing these things longing to meet with God, there would be God's presence would fill uh, his temple. And... Um, he says, I'm about to shake things. And well, what was the great shaking that he was talking about? Well, the great shaking was this, Jesus. Jesus was the great shaking up uh, of uh, which Haggai was prophesying, a, a better covenant. And I want you to notice, he said, I will shake uh, the heavens and the earth um, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. So Jesus came not just so that the uh, Israel, uh, God's God's people, God's pilgrim people would would have a new experience, but He's actually saying, "I want to throw the doors wide open so that all nations now can be blessed uh, it, uh, through the presence of God coming to His temple." And when Jesus came and when He died on the cross, it says the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. In other words, He was. He was saying, right, this is now the end of that Levitical system. This is now the end of people being outside this curtain. They can't go into God's presence. We're now coming to an end of that. You're no longer having to rely on a priest going in to represent you, but you can't go into God's presence yourself. Haggai was prophesying there would be a shaking, so much so that all nations would now know and feel the glory of God. That it was not going to be just for a few people or a priest representing us. There's something now that's replaced all of that. The Levitical system is ended. The temple itself was destroyed some years after the, the curtain temple was, was torn in two. And the Bible now says that you are now being built into a temple. So in, in 1 Peter uh, 2... Um, verse 6 it says behold i'm laying in zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame so what what he's saying there is that um, in verse 5 you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house or spiritual temple to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ 
So what the Bible's saying there is that we no longer have a priest, we are the priesthood. Those of us who've received Jesus as our saviour, he's come to dwell in us. So we are now the temple where God dwells. He doesn't belong in a building anymore. He's not, he doesn't live in a building dwelt, made by hands. God's people, those who've got, put their faith in Jesus, who've got access to the Father through Jesus Christ, his son who he sent for us, we are now the temple of God and we're being built together. Now that's quite a shaking because we don't know it, have, we don't any longer have to go to a special place where God is. We are where God dwells, those of us who've received him as our saviour. And the wonder of the church is this, that it's not dependent on a building, it's not dependent even on meeting in a certain place. And the coronavirus uh, situation does throw everything into um, a really different situation, doesn't it? As many times through history, God's people have perhaps been persecuted or unable to meet. We're now not able to meet because of a pandemic. Um, but that doesn't stop the church in any way, it doesn't affect the church. Let me just read um, something that John Newton says about this uh, in the section in his preach on this uh, passage. He said, the temple of Jerusalem has been long since destroyed. But he, God, has still a house, a house not made with hands. This is his church, comprising all the members of his mystical body. He dwells in each of them individually. He dwells in and among them collectively. Where two or three are met in his name, where his ordinances are administered and prized, where his gospel is faithfully preached and cordially received, there he is, present in the midst of them. There his glory is seen, his voice heard, his power felt, his goodness tasted, and the savour of his name is diffused as a precious ointment which refreshes the hearts of his people, renews their strength and comforts them under all their sorrows and cares. The glory and magnificence of the temple worship, even in the days of Solomon, was faint compared with the glory displayed to the hearts of believers who worship him in spirit and truth under the New Testament dispensation. But it can only be perceived by an enlightened and spiritual mind. To outward appearance, all may be low and humiliating. The malice of their enemies has often constrained God's people to assemble in woods and on mountains, in places underground or in the dead of the night, to secrete themselves from informers. But vaulted roofs and costly garments, the solemn parade of processions, music and choristers, and the presence of nobles and dignitaries are not necessary to constitute the glory of gospel worship. It is enough that he in whose names they meet condescends to visit them with the power and influence of his spirit, to animate and hear their prayers, to feed them with the good word of his grace, and to fill them with joy and peace in believing. If they have these blessings, they desire no more. They are compensated for all their difficulties and hardships. And however unnoticed and despised by the world, they can say, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. For they approach by faith to the city of the living God, the Jerusalem which is above, to the worship which is carried on day and night by the innumerable company of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, quite a long quote, but what an amazing description of who we as the church are. And I suppose the thing I'd want to just leave us with to think about is, even if we're not meeting physically, God's temple, his church on earth, is very, very much alive and filled with his presence. And whether you're watching this, or wherever you're watching this, and perhaps thinking about your church or loved ones in church who you can't meet with or see or whatever let's just realize globally god's church is his his presence is in his church we are his temple we don't have to go to buildings we are the building of god we're being built together not by hands out of bricks and stone but by his spirit so let's rejoice in that and i'll just pray for us father thank you that we are your temple we're being built together as a spiritual house for you, where you dwell. Thank you, Lord, your word says you've chosen Zion, you've chosen your church as the place where you delight to dwell. 
And we thank you that those of us who've received you as our Saviour are now indwelt by the very presence of God himself. When priests could only go in on occasions to represent and connect God with man, thank you that God has come to man through the person of Jesus Christ. And he was crucified, buried and rose on the third day and ascended to heaven. And now he has sent his spirit who now lives within my heart and the heart of everyone who's received him as their saviour. Hallelujah, what a glorious thing that your temple on the earth is not restricted or bound or limited by bricks and mortar. We are a living temple. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that even through this coronavirus um, pandemic, Lord, that your temple will increase in the earth that many many uh, men and women young and old will come to know Jesus as their saviour through this time and that the temple of God on the earth the glorious house of God will be built brick by brick by brick as people come to know Jesus in large numbers over this season that we're in we ask it in Jesus name amen <clears throat> so just to say if any of you watching who are not as yet believers and you've not received Jesus into your life and received him as your saviour well this is a, a great opportunity to do that God says he will come and dwell in your heart you don't have to go somewhere to meet with him he will come and dwell within your heart so maybe think about that maybe think about the fact that Jesus shook the heavens and the earth by coming God became a man came and walked among us lived a perfect life died on the cross taking our sin and our wrongdoing on himself he had none of his own he took ours and when he did that and he died the temple curtain was torn so that God and man no longer had to be separated because of our sinfulness what a fantastic piece of news that is and the invitation for you this morning is that if you just say Jesus I receive what you've done for me I ask you to be my saviour my king my lord you become part of God's temple on the earth and his spirit comes to dwell within you. What a wonderful, wonderful yet simple way to access the very presence of God and we can call him Father and know the security that that brings at such a time as, as this. So I'll see you next time when we do one of these. You might want to listen to part three of the Messiah. Uh, if you can find it, stick your old earphones in, have a listen to it. Uh, Haggai 2, 6 and 7 shakings of the heavens and the earth. Bless you. See you next time.